Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 9. My intention was to cover Psalm 9 last time we were together. That wasn't God's plan, and now I know why. The plan tonight is to cover Psalm 9, Psalm 10, Psalm 11, and Psalm 12. Every one of those psalms. Psalm 9 is what is called an imprecatory psalm. What's that? Oh, okay, imprecatory. Victor's saying imprecatory. Huh. It's a desperate, desperate cry for justice. There seems to be this hunger for, this desire, this longing for justice these days. But I'm afraid the justice that certain people are looking for is not really justice. What should believers do in the face of injustice? What should be our approach? What should we be doing? I've said it before, I believe it, it's not original with me, but I believe for every sigh, there is a psalm. For every sigh, there is a psalm. For every emotion, everything we face as individuals has been dealt with prayerfully and praisefully, if that's a word, in the Psalms. Psalm 9 through 12, each one of these Psalms address or deal with the wicked. Every one of them mention the wicked. Three of the four call on the Lord for him to arise or to act. And the one that doesn't ask the Lord to arise declares that the Lord is watching. He's watching. He's seeing what is happening. Have you felt lately that wickedness is on the rise? Have you felt like wickedness is winning? Well, the psalmist often felt that way. And that's where we get these imprecatory psalms, where the psalmist is crying out, desiring God to do something about it. And so I'm just going to throw the spoiler out there to you. We're not going to wait till the conclusion. I want to put it out there for you to be thinking about with each one of these psalms. It amazes me how they seem to dovetail together. Here's the takeaway. Remember him when the wicked win. Remember him when the wicked win. It seems like today that many, many believers are in a tailspin. They've become overwhelmed with what seems to be happening. They've been shaken to the core. Many of them seem like they're giving up, that there's no hope. They don't know what to do. Well, if you feel that way, these psalms should be an encouragement to you. Psalm 9 being an imprecatory psalm starts out unusual, I think, but very, very appropriate. In the first two verses, we see a repeated, I will. The psalmist says, I will, I will, I will, I will. Can I remind you tonight that praise <clears throat> is not a feeling? Some of you just kind of looked at me like, what? Praise is not a feeling. 
Now, let me just say, I've been saved since I was 15 years old. I have felt a lot of things in praise. I've busted out into laughter in praise. I've cried my eyes out in praise. I've put my nose in the carpet, burying myself flat on the ground in God's presence during praise. I've danced, not publicly, in praise. I've sang in praise, as Paul said. I've sang in the natural. I've sang in the spirit. I've felt a lot of things in praise. But praise is not a feeling. If you only praise the Lord when you feel it, whatever it is, you don't understand praise. I was listening to a pastor recently talking about the revivals that have happened throughout church history. One is known as the Azusa Street Revival. And one of the main founding individuals involved in that particular revival was interviewed and this person said, this revival, this move will not last. And people did everything they could. Publishing houses were created. Ministries were formed. Denominations came out of it. Man did everything he could to keep it rolling, to keep it happening. Just here in this town, not many years ago, a revival took place and and sanctuaries were built on top of sanctuaries, on top of sanctuaries, trying to, to keep it going. But this individual was wise, I believe, and prophetic. This person said it's not going to continue, and it'll start diminishing when the Holy Spirit is talked about more than Jesus. When the Holy Spirit becomes the focus and not Jesus. And I thought, hmm, that's, that's true. This person also said, when prayer is no longer a priority, the movement will diminish. And the third thing this person said was, when worship is worshipped, it will diminish. And I thought, wow. Praise is not a feeling. We, we shouldn't be trying to manufacture something. The Bible talks about a sacrifice of praise. I think oftentimes people have made the misconception, the assumption that when they see an individual or maybe myself up front, hands raised, Worshiping the Lord, they're thinking, oh, wow, Gordon or he or she is just caught up in the presence of the Lord. Oh, to be that person. Don't think that every time you see someone in praise that they're feeling something. And the psalmist says, I will, I will, I will. I will. He doesn't say, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. You say, Gordon, it seems like you're spending a lot of time here. As we look at these Psalms, I believe it'll make more sense. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 9. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. The psalmist says, there will be no half-hearted praise here. No half-hearted praise. I've heard it said, I believe it's true, we go, to, we go to fights and ball games and political rallies and we'll scream to the top of our voice till we get laryngitis and can't speak the day after. We come to the sanctuary and, well... 
I will praise you with my whole heart. The psalmist is saying, my praise is going to be serious. I'm going to be serious about praise. Because the Lord is worthy of it. Then he says, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. He says, my praise is going to be serious and my praise is going to be speaking. I'm going to praise the Lord because I'm going to show forth his marvelous works. Look what God did here. Look what God's doing over here. Look what God told me here. Look at God's promise here. Look how God did this. Look how God answered this prayer. The psalmist says, I will declare his marvelous works. And the bigger the crowd of believers you get in, the longer that refrain ought to be. Because he's done so much, so much in our lives. Just this past week, he's done so much for me. Things that I did not deserve, reports that I wondered how they would turn out. He says, I'm going to show forth your wonderful works. Now remember, this is an imprecatory psalm. The psalmist is about to talk about all the bad things that are happening and all that the wicked are doing. But he starts off with praise. I'm going to praise the Lord with my whole heart. I'm going to show forth his marvelous works. Look at verse 2. I will be sad. No, I'm sorry. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. He says, you're going to know my praise because it's going to be serious. You're going to know my praise because I'm going to always be speaking of the Lord. You're going to know my praise because of the smile on my face. What took away your smile? What can take away your smile? It amazes me when you look at science. Far too many Christians think that the Bible and science are contrary one to another. Science is always trying to catch up with the truth, always trying to catch up with the scriptures. And it's interesting, the world today seems like, oh, we, we believe in the science. Do you know that science started with believers? If you go back to the originators of, the, of studying science and know, these were believers, not, not ungodly, worldly-minded individuals, believers. And medical science has proven that you can, if you right now, I would, I'm just, could, would everybody just smile? Just, just smile. At that moment that you smiled, your body released a party chemical in your brain. Serotonin, dopamine, all of these chemicals. Just us, and some of you were faking it. You just did it because I asked you to. But even a fake smile, a fake belly laugh, Science is proven. You can just go, ha, 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 And it has positive effects on you physically and emotionally. And the Lord says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And far too many Christians are still going, I'm not so sure about that. The psalmist says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. My praise will be serious. My praise will be in my speaking. My praise will be in my smiling. And lastly, he says, I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. You'll know my praise because I'm going to be singing. I'm going to be singing and not the blues. Not the blues. Now, some might argue that the Psalms we're looking at could be like the blues. But in all of these psalms, except for one, the blues shift focus into the blue and see the Lord. Verse 3. 
So now we're in a mindset of praise. We need to keep that mindset. He says, when my enemies are turned back, not if, notice, when. Not if my enemies turn back. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast, past tense, thou hast maintained my right and my cause. That word right in the Hebrew means justice. That word cause there means a legal suit or a case. You have maintained my justice. You might be thinking, well, it doesn't feel like justice. I've been mistreated. I've been overlooked. I've been stabbed in the back. You're not seeing it the right way. I've been passed over for this, that, and the other. You're not looking at it the right way. I could jump into some neuroscience. But do you know that the Bible talks about the renewing of the mind? It's called neuroplasticity. You have grooves in your mind, default thought processes. You, you, you revert back to them over and over and over again. But we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We are not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. When we focus on the Lord, when we look to the Lord, when we learn of the Lord, we can see the past differently. A classic example, one of my favorites is Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph, mistreated by his entire family, sold into slavery, falsely accused, sat forgotten in prison. And here's how he looks back over that. He doesn't look back and say, my dad didn't believe me. None of my family supported my dream. They all hated me and were jealous of me. They all turned against me. I was sold into slavery, then falsely accused by my boss's wife and sat in prison. And I was innocent. I know everybody in prison says they're innocent, but I really was. He doesn't say any of that. We've got believers saying, well, this happened and that happened and that happened and my parents divorced and my dad was a drug addict and I was abused and I was... You meant it for evil, Joseph says. But God meant it for good. Verse 4, for thou hast maintained my right and my cause. It doesn't matter what's happening. You've maintained my right and my cause. Thou sattest in thy throne judging right. Judging right. Keep that in mind. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. And then he shifts and starts talking to the enemy. He says, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. Verse 7. Key verse. Shifting verse. The blues looked to the blue. Remember him when the wicked win, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. The final verdict is not in. Everybody's been out of shape. The Supreme Court did this, or they won't hear this case, or now they've heard this case, and how did they come to that decision? And this judge is saying this, and that judge is saying that, and oh my. Remember him when the wicked win. He is the judge, the final verdict. Justice, listen, justice will be served. You can count on it. It's a done deal. In John chapter 5, Jesus is the Father, doesn't judge because he's turned all judgment over to the Son. 
in Acts chapter 17. We recently studied it. We read where the Lord has appointed a man who will judge the world in righteousness. And that man, listen, that man is none other than our Savior. The one who gave his life for me to save me is the one who will sit in judgment against all who have been against me. If I can trust him with my salvation, surely I can trust him to bring about justice. Some of you are getting it. Some of you are still singing the blues. I would encourage you to read verse 7 again. I'll do it for you. But the Lord shall endure forever. He's, he's judged forever. Not one thing is going to get by him. Not one little thing. He's going to sit in judgment. The sinner will stand before what is known as the great white throne judgment. And the saint is going to stand before the bema seat of Christ. The sinner better be getting about the business of repentance. And the saint better be getting about the business of the kingdom. Because Jesus didn't just save me and punch my ticket to get on this train and sit back and do nothing until I get there. I've got breath. I've got life. I will praise you with my whole heart. I will proclaim your wonderful works. I will will be glad and rejoice. I will sing. I'm going to serve the Lord because I'm going to stand before him. He's going to reward me for what he's done in me and through me. And then I'm going to cast those rewards at his feet for his ultimate glory. Oh, wow. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. It's going to be right. He's going to make it right. How can you be glad and rejoice with all this wickedness? Because he's going to make it right. Whatever is wrong in your life, he's going to make it right. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. That's why the Lord says through Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. He's going to take care of it. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Oh, we could spend all night on that verse. The more you know the Lord, the more you will trust the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Jesus says, you search the scriptures, they testify of me. And the more I know him, the easier it is to trust him. The fact that I know that he is the eternal, supremest judge sets my heart at ease. Oh, what are we going to do? The wicked are running amok. The wicked are doing this and the wicked are doing that and they're marching in the streets and they're flying their flags and they're changing literature and they're... But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. They that know thy name shall put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest, liftest me up from the gates of death that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. He's delivered me from the gates of death. Jesus says, on this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail. It might look like they're winning, but they're not winning. They're losers. We're the winners. In the end, we win because he wins. That's why we need to remember him when the wicked win. And he's delivered me from the gates of death. 
so that I can stand in the gates of the city and proclaim him and rejoice in him and rejoice in his salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made and the net which they hid in their own foot is taken. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Have you heard the news? Have you seen the headlines? They're doing this and they're scheming this and they're trying to put this law together and they're trying to pass this. Oh, oh, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. They're going to fall into the ditch. They're going to be snared in the net. <laughs> the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. That is true. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion Selah. Higion means meditation. Sila means to think about that. A double meditation. The Lord is known for his judgment. We've seen his judgment all throughout the scripture. He said, the wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations, all the nations that forget God. That would include the great U.S. of A. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Expectation. That word there is found in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith God, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Why do we keep acting like our end is up for grabs? Why do believers, me included, why do we keep acting like that the story hasn't been written yet? That, oh, well, this group might cause this to happen. And you remember those stories? I don't know if they still make those books, but when I was a kid, they had these books that you start reading and you get to a certain point and it says, you get to choose. If you, if you want to choose this, you turn to page 78. If you want to choose this, you turn to page 152. And depending on what you choose is how your ending ends up in the... That's not how our lives work to give you a future and a hope, an expected end. That's why in Psalm 62, 5, the psalmist says, My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is of him. He's writing my story. He's writing your story. And he's the judge. Nothing's going to get past him. And then the psalmist says in 19, Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. They're just men. They're just men. So, remember him when the wicked win. Remember, the final verdict is not in. And he is the judge. The final verdict is coming. Psalm 10, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? I'll ask a question to this question. Why do we think God has abandoned us when we have trouble? Where did we get that in the church? Don't look at me like I've never thought that. I know you've thought that. I've thought that. Things go bad. We immediately thought, Lord, um, hello. The good news is, is, in Psalm 46, 1, the psalmist says, he's a very present help in times of trouble. If you'll keep trusting him, if you'll keep serving him, you will find that to be true. There may be times that you feel like, oh, Lord, why, why are you so far away? See, one of the reasons why we feel things like this and we think things like this is because, like the psalmist says, they that know thy name trust you. When we understand God's omnipresence, we should never feel like God is away. How can we feel like God is away when he is ever present everywhere? Besides the fact that all the times in Deuteronomy and Hebrews and Matthew 28 and all through the Psalms, the Lord says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here. Why are you far away, Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? He hasn't. He doesn't. 
Here's the wicked again, verse 2. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. The wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. He blesseth the covetous which the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Read Romans 1. You see what happens to a nation, a people, an individual that decides, I don't want God in my thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. Does that sound familiar? Seems like that's all we hear anymore. He sitteth in the lurking places and the villages and the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his internet. I mean, I mean, his net. Hmm. He croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. And here's the cry. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. When the ark would set out of the camp, Moses would say in Numbers chapter 10, Arise, may the Lord arise and his enemies be scattered. Wherefore doth the wicked con contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it. For thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Notice this. I love imprecatory psalms and prayers. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Break his arm, Lord. You ever prayed like that? A lot of scholars say that we shouldn't pray like that. I pray like that. You say, well, Gordon, you shouldn't. God wouldn't be pleased. Well, here's the good news. I have a high priest. And all of my prayers pass through his hands. And all the junk prayers, they don't make it to the throne. Only the sanctified ones make it there. God knows my heart. Better to be honest in the presence of the Lord than to harbor it in my heart and mind and act like it doesn't exist. And if you get offended by break his arm, fasten your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen, because we're going to get to bust his teeth out of his mouth and dash his head upon a stone, right? I mean, interesting. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. And the blues, the blues shift into the blue. Here it is. Just like verse 7 in Psalm 9. Look at verse 16 and Psalm 10. The Lord is king forever. Not only is he the judge, not only is justice going to be served. Oh, there's a ring to that, isn't it? Every wrong is going to be made right. He's also king. So he has the final verdict. And he has the final authority. The final authority. We're arguing in this nation over who has authority over this and who has authority over that and who can tell me this and you can't tell me to do that and you can't make me wear a mask and you can't make me be vaccinated and he's got the final authority. In Matthew 28, Jesus says, all authority has been given unto me. All means all and that's all all means. That means there is no other authority anywhere else. Look out, Mr. President. Look out, Mr. and Miss Congressman. Senator, governor, mayor, look out, the supremest, you think, court, that is not the supremest. You may be supreme with all the little extra toppings as a pizza, but you are not the supremest. The Lord is king forever. The heathen are perished out of his land. He's the king. He's the king. So I should be seeking the judge. I should be living my life in the midst of the wickedness around me thinking about that Bema seat. I'm going to stand before him. So I'm going to serve him. I'm going to work for him. I'm not going to be distracted by the wicked. 
I should also understand that he's the king. And I should be praying every single day. This should be our prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. I honestly believe, and Victor and I have talked about this quite a bit. I honestly believe some of the stuff that we're experiencing today, some of the stuff that the church is going through, is necessary because she has become carnal and worldly. And she's no longer desiring of the rapture or the Lord's return or of heaven. She's comfortable. She's cozy. She kind of likes the way things are here. And so God in his mercy and his grace says, okay, well, I'll give you a belly full like he did Israel. Oh, you want flesh? I'll give you flesh. It'll be coming out of your nose. You'll be vomiting it out. I'll give you all the flesh. Here, you want some more flesh? You want some? Mm -mm, yes. You want more flesh? Here you go. He's the king, and he's got the final authority. So you can pass whatever bill you want to pass. You can sign whatever executive order you want to sign, whether you're Republican or Democrat, makes no difference. You can, you, can, you can take any case or reject any case or make any determination. He's the judge, and he's the king. Are you starting to see why the psalmist says, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you. You're the judge, and you're the king. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. He's the judge. I know the judge. And I've got the best defense attorney in the universe. The case for me has already been thrown out. And I know the king. So I will praise you with my whole heart. Psalm 11. So we've got the final verdict. He's the judge. We've got the final authority. He's the king. Now, in Psalm 11, we're going to see the final witness. He's the holy one. Notice this. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Christians are thinking, let's gather up all the beans, bullets, and band-aids and run to the mountains. Dig us a bunker. Get ready for the zombie apocalypse. How say you to my soul, flee? Nehemiah said, should, should such a man as I flee? Pfft. The righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. And notice, I've heard this. I've heard this so much lately. Look at this verse. He says, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrows upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The very foundation is being destroyed. I hear so many saints lamenting. The foundation is being eroded. What will the righteous do if the foundation is destroyed? Do you remember what happened when Babylon came in and overtook Israel? What happened to the foundation? And then 70 years later, you know what happened? If the Lord chooses, it was restored. It was relayed in the temple. And the old men cried because they looked at, at what was now, not what it was then. And the young men rejoiced. And the Lord said that the glory of this latter was more than that of the first because Messiah, Jesus, showed up in the second one. And even if the foundations of this country be destroyed, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and he says, the foundation of the Lord stands. And the writer of Hebrews says that Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And tonight we stand on a foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Oh, yes, I love this country. Oh, I believe in this country. But if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Look at the next verse. The psalmist tells us. 
The Lord is in his holy temple. Look up. Far too many saints. This is what they're doing. They're looking down at the foundation. And everything's shaking. And everything seems shaking. They're going, oh, look, look, look. Stop it. Stop it. Look up. Why? Because the Lord is in his holy temple. And he even says, what can be shaken will be shaken. We should be expecting a whole lot of shaking to go on. But we will not be moved because we stand on the rock which is higher than us. Jesus, if any man hears my words and, and does them, I will liken unto him as a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rains came, the winds blew, the floods rose, beat upon that house, and it didn't fall because it was founded on a rock. Let it shake. Let it shake. The Lord is in his temple. He's the final witness. He's the holy one. Notice, he is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Dear saint, don't you know? That his eye is on you. We are the apple of his eye. That's that, that's that reflection. You got to be really close to something to see that reflection. You ever seen your reflection in somebody's eye or, or something reflecting? That's how close he is. What can the righteous do if the foundations be shaken? <gasps> run, run. The British are coming. The British are coming. He's in his holy temple. His cord is ready. He's seated on the throne. And he is in his holy temple. It's okay. We're going to be okay. Last Psalm, Psalm 12. The final word. The final word. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. You ever feel that way lately? For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. Do you know that Daniel says in Daniel 11 that one of the tools that that wicked, worldly, coming leader is going to use is flattery and words. Have you noticed how there seems to be a hijacking of words? Victor and I were talking about that before the service and he, he brought to my attention something that just last year was called one thing and this year now it's called a totally different thing. Different administration talked about, talked about it under the old administration they called it this and now that the same thing's happening now it's, it's called this. They love to take these words and they think. Notice, let's keep reading. Look at verse, uh, verse 3. We'll get to verse 4. Verse 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. You better watch your tongue. Forget that bar of soap that your mama threatened. God's going to cut it out. Whew. Verse 4, who have said, this is what they say, with our tongue we will prevail. With our tongue we're going to prevail. We're going to say this and say that and call it this and define it that and redefine this and redefine that and we're going to prevail with our tongue. And you know what's sad? Church folk are parroting that trash. Church folk have taken up their language. 
we call stuff that God calls something else, we call it what they call it now. We're teaching the same stuff they teach. We're bringing their books into the sanctuary and we're lecturing congregations on the same type of stuff. And notice, not that I care really, but I notice the Pope now is interested in all things green. Even, listen, believe it or not, green spirituality. Whatever that might be. But that's how fo with our tongues we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now will I arise. The psalmist has been saying, arise, Lord, arise, Lord, arise, Lord. And we should be praying the same thing. Arise, Lord. Arise, Lord. Act, Lord. Work, Lord. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. There's coming a day when the Lord is going to say, I will arise. It is time. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. And then, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, seven being the number of completion, purified seven times. It is as pure as it can be. I want you to think about the attack this book has faced through the years. Just think about it. Do you know the Constitution, the thing that everybody's like all up in arms about in our country today? It's been amended. And rightfully so. Do you know that this hasn't? There's not an amendment to this. This is pure. There's never coming a day when the Lord's going to say, you know, after thinking about it, Never. Sin is still sin. Salvation still comes the same way. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's declared it. He's got the final word. And if you looked at the church today, you would wonder if they believe that. I didn't know this. But I think that if you put a Bible on the dash of your car, you won't get into wrecks. Not really, but you would think that. You ever seen all these Bibles thrown up in the back of cars and in the dash of, it's like, what? what? And they just sit there and they're faded by the sun. I also think that if you put Bibles on coffee tables and bookshelves, they won't float out of your house. Here's something else that I think Bibles are good at. For those of you who don't like cleaning a lot, you could place that Bible out there and it will track dust from your house and it will just catch all the dust. I'm being silly. But the approach so many take to this book. And we talked about the judge in the first psalm that we looked at. The book of Revelation tells us that the books are going to be open. And I believe this is going to be one of those books. Jesus' is heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will never pass away. We can still stand on it, sure-footed. He hasn't changed his mind. He's not going to. And it's time for us to start living our life as if we know the one who gets the final word. Well, Gordon, they're calling you this name. Okay. They're calling you that name. All right. They're saying you're one of these. You're saying, they're saying you're one of those. Whatever. 
Well, aren't you upset about it? No. Because he calls me friend. He calls me his own. Whose report are you going to believe? Verse 7, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Notice, forever he is judge. Forever he is king. Forever his throne is in heaven. His temple is established. Forever his word will Stand. Hmm. From this generation forevermore. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Christians are exalting vile men. We should be exalting Jesus. That's who we should be exalting. So tonight, remember him. When the wicked win, when you feel like oh, they're winning, they're, they're, they're taking over, they're controlling everything, the foundations are shaking. It's all going to end up in a courtroom. And God is the judge. It's all going to end up before a throne. And Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Every person's going to be measured by the holiness of God. And his word will stand. So what should we be doing? Well, the psalm started out, I will praise, I will praise, I will praise, I will praise. But why? I should be praising the Lord because of his judgment, because of his justice, because everyone's going to stand before him and he's going to make it right. I should be praising him because he is king of kings and lord of lords and he has not only the final verdict but the final authority. Nobody can do anything to me that he doesn't allow. Don't that feel good? I mean, I, you can't touch me unless God lets you. You can't hurt me unless God allows you. You can't take anything from me unless he lets you. I mean, the confidence that brings. We even have record in the Old Testament where God keeps a pagan king from sinning. If he can keep a pagan king from sinning, surely he can keep me and lead me and guide me and help me. Even if he's got to prepare a wind and a great fish to puke me out on the beach. He's king. It's his authority. And he is holy. He's holy. We shouldn't be focusing on the wickedness. We should be joining in with the heavenly eternal chorus. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They're changing the rules, Gordon. No, they're not. They're changing morality, Gordon. No, they're not. And his word will stand. That's why I'm going to stand on it. I'm going to stand on it. And I want to encourage you. I don't know about you, but I'm receiving this encouragement myself. May we make this commitment from this moment forward. The only language we speak is this. What would happen if those who think we're going to prevail with our words, if we took eternal words and spoke them? I can tell you what would happen. The church would stop running and hiding. Because when you turn the light on, 
the bugs go under the refrigerator. The bugs run. We need to be a light that shines in the darkness. I hope you're encouraged. I'm encouraged. I know it's Wednesday, and you're trying to be encouraged. You'll hold it till Sunday. But he's the judge. He's the king. He is holy, and his word will stand. It doesn't matter how wicked it gets, and it doesn't matter how much the foundation shakes. Just keep looking up. Forget the blues. Look to the blue. Remember him when the wicked win. Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word tonight.